Hi there, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this APNG International Webinar and uh, hello to all our uh, listeners out in Australia and New Zealand. I hope you're all keeping well. Uh, my name is Mark Constable, I'm on the APNG team uh, here in the UK and I'm delighted to be joined by our presenter Melanie Franklin. Um, Melanie's uh, an expert in all things change, so an author, trainer, consultant um and with a, with a strong background in projects and program management but now yeah strong focus on change management and agile change management in particular so you're in really great hands for this session where melanie's going to be talking to us about how some agile change techniques can really help us with some of the common problems we experience with projects and change initiatives um, just before we get into the detail, allow me to cover a few housekeeping items. So the first thing to note is we are recording the session uh, and everyone that's uh, registered will receive a follow up email uh, fairly soon, uh, as soon as we've got the recording available online. Um, secondly, you have an option to submit questions at any stage throughout the presentation. So you should see uh, a questions function on your GoToWebinar control panel. So feel free to submit those at any point and we'll address as many as we can towards the end. Uh, and last but not least, your feedback's very welcome in terms of uh, how the webinar went um, and everything in the background. So uh, that's all, all useful for when we're planning and delivering webinars in the future. Uh, so I think that's all housekeeping. So without further ado, I'll bring in Mel at this point. Mel, over to you. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna be talking through the Agile concepts. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Agile planning technique, the roadmap, and then I'm going to put up some of my biggest challenges because I'm running um, several major change initiatives at the moment and I'm using everything that we're talking about in this webinar. Um, so I'm going to explain how I use some of the concepts we're talking about um, to solve some of the biggest issues that we all come up against about uncertainty, about uh, lack of availability of business resources to contribute to the project because they're so busy. Um, working with waterfall initiatives and how that works. So my plan is to keep this really practical. Um, so I do welcome questions. I welcome anything that you would like to tell me about the challenges you currently have on some of your initiatives um, so that we can uh, engage in solving some of your problems. Um, so this is part webinar, part consultancy, if you like. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions about you, though, so that I can understand who my audience is. So Mark's got uh, two poll questions. So if you could answer those, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, thanks. Paul. First one's open and it's uh, are you uh, oh, sorry, are you managing a project change or both? I just wanted to get to know if I've got the project management community with me, the change management community with me or both. Looks largely the change community. It's got 77%. Okay, well, welcome to the change community then. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. Thank you. And um, one more question from Mark. Uh, the second question should be on screen now for everyone. Uh, so, do you have an agile qualification? I can't talk about agile change without asking you um, maybe some of the whether you know the basics of agile and the certifications. A quick shortcut to, to knowing if you know the basics. Yeah, I'm pretty even here, Mel. Um, well, it's just swayed a little bit towards no. Uh, so, so hovering around 60% no, 40% yes. Okay, all right, okay. So I will start off then with um, some of the basics around Agile. Let's start by talking about the fact that we know there are lots of different Agile methodologies out there. Um, through APMG, you may have studied the Agile Business Consortium's Agile PM qualification or Agile Business Analyst qualification. Um, you might be aware of Scrum Alliance, uh, who have qualifications like the Certified Scrum Master, Certified Product Owner. Um, there's also Scaled Agile Framework is probably one of the, the biggest sellers uh, in terms of upscaling um, an agile approach across multiple teams and possibly looking at it from a more portfolio uh, basis. All of those, including the agile manifesto that kicked everything off in a, in a formal sense over 20 years ago, um, have a set of principles, things that if we hold true, we'll be working in a, a sort of an agile way. Um, these vary from eight principles to 13 principles, depending on uh, which body you're looking at. And that's an awful lot to remember. Um, having studied and trained and 
applied agile over the last 15 years i've cut it down to five key concepts because i'm often in the boardroom and i am trying to navigate my way through an organization that wants to become more agile and trying to discover what that really means for them and what their priorities are um, and so these concepts keep me honest if you like the first is a recognition that business need is the reason we're doing our project and or change initiative whatever you want to call it um, just to put on the table i have a, a very strong view that um, projects and change have a tight relationship um, projects deliver tangible change they deliver something new something different that didn't exist before either based on an amended version of what existed before or something brand new now that can be a new platform, a new app, but it could also be a new, uh, a new organization structure or a new set of processes perhaps brought in by new regulations. But there is that tangible change. And the 77% of you who said you're in change management can probably appreciate that there's also the behavioral change piece. There's the, we've got to create this as a new way of working. We've got to form a new habit with people. So we have to lead them through that transition from the very comfortable old ways of working, the unconscious competence, and through that challenge of being made to feel consciously incompetent, we've got to do something new, it's a bit of a shock to the system, all those old certainties have gone, and then come out the other side having, well, probably practiced quite a lot, um, had lots of announcements, made you aware, made you excited about the change, got you on board, got you practicing, and then it's become your own. So I do think those two things sit very comfortably together. Um, whether you call that a project, because you're incorporating the change, or whether you call it a change initiative, I'm not so worried. I'm just thinking it's a means to an end. It's about creating benefits at the end of the day. And this is what should drive us. What are the benefits? We want to make an improvement, whether those benefits are very much in the financial sphere, so a cost reduction, a revenue increase, or whether they are about greater staff engagement, customer satisfaction, um, which I think leads to those higher level benefits. At the end of the day, what does the business need and when does it need it should be our driving force. And if we understand that, then we can prioritise our initiative in the right way. We, we're delivering the absolute must have items at the start. So if we have got business need, then I think that leads us to two things. It leads us to on time delivery, because we have to go back to this idea that we need to deliver things not in the time scale that might suit us, but the time scale that's relevant for the business. What does the business need and when does it need it? A failure to deliver on time, I think is the big issue because what happens, we all know that we have to sort of energize everybody to get ready. We're switching this on on the 15th of December, let's get ready for this. And then a couple of weeks before that, we turn around and say, oh, there's gonna be some delays. So we've got two issues now. The first is all of that wasted effort while people were preparing and probably stopped doing certain things because they were thinking they were moving to a new platform or a new process or a new team. And then we have to start all that energy up again in the new year. But the other problem is we've lost all our credibility because people don't trust us anymore and they don't trust the deadline. So they're certainly less committed to it. And of course, that has a big impact on our benefits, because not only have we now delayed the benefits by a number of weeks, but also we're probably going to get um, a slower uptake um, of the new behaviours and therefore um, a slower um, acquisition of the benefits. So on time delivery really matters. And we're going to have a look at how the agile planning technique, the roadmap helps us get there. The other thing I think is that it's this idea of iterations. Um, I was with somebody from Brazil yesterday and she was sort of saying, what is an iteration? And I said, well, you know, in methodologies, it could be called a tranche, a stage, a phase, a wave or a chunk. Really, it's a chunk of work. But by chunking things up, we know that we can get something out early and we can test it, get the feedback, see if it's having the effect we thought it would have. 
and then we can build on it. But also, we that early feedback is useful, but so is the early return on investment. So on-time delivery in short waves or bursts of change, really helpful. And of course, that leads us ultimately to the evolving solution. Um, where we're not waiting for the benefits because we are doing that iterative approach, but also because we keep touching base with our client groups, the business that we're impacting, we can check on our relevancy as well and make sure that we are delivering things that are solving their problems, giving them more functionality, enabling them to service their customers better. Very four very simple concepts and sitting behind all of them is the idea of collaboration. Collaboration is organised sharing of activities. Um, collaboration accompanies each of the others because we need to collaborate to really find the business need. We need to collaborate to get the right timetable. Um, we need to collaborate on which of our versions goes first. What do we do first? What do we do next? And of course, leading to the evolving solution. I think for me, the collaboration is really important. I, I know there's a lot of Agile modules that talk about the one team culture. Um, but what that means for me in, in very practical sense is that I'm trying to collaborate with technical experts who very much from the project world can build me the thing that we need. After all, the project with that tangible change really is the trigger for the new ways of working. But they're probably looking at it through a lens of technical excellence and what works and what should be included and what shouldn't. But by collaborating with those who are impacted, who are actually going to work in the new way, then what we get is that business pragmatism because they're speaking up on behalf of their end customers and they're talking about what will make a difference really to them. I think there's lots of examples from a technology world, um, which we've probably all experienced, where perhaps that collaboration isn't happening because the voice of the user isn't that strong. And so you get these giant platforms that have amazing amounts of functionality, but actually you only use about 5% of it. Um, that's very costly for an organisation to go down that route where we continually build technical excellence and we oh, it's able to do this now and this, but we haven't heard enough. We haven't truly collaborated with the business and therefore that pragmatism of what will actually work in practice and what will be most useful for them, which of course feeds our prioritization, isn't being heard. So for me, that's what the collaboration is. And yesterday afternoon, I was in a workshop where we were really looking at what collaboration means in, in terms of organised sharing of information and activities. So we, we got into how are we going to organise organize ourselves to genuinely share those things. So there's something very practical in there as far as I'm concerned. Now, I talked about this idea of the roadmap. Well, as you can see here, we have our overall sort of time frame along the top whatever time frame that is, although um, I think that anything more than about a year gets very uncomfortable because obviously it takes us into a, another financial year. But also with the huge amount of change that is taking place all of the time, many of the uh, initiatives that, that can knock us sideways, um, the VUCA world, if you like, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. With that happening, I think anything longer than about a year makes me uncomfortable. And also, to be fair, when I'm looking at chunking that time up, I'm looking at maybe two to three months. Um, I was looking at the holiday calendars. I'm navigating through sort of Thanksgiving and then coming into Christmas now, um, trying to get things finished before the end of the year. Um, I know that um, in whatever country I'm working in in the West, there will be spring holidays, um, whether it's the uh, Christian festival of Easter. Um, there, there's also Ramadan coming up fairly early this year. So that gives me another three months or so after the new year to get something done. So I'm, I'm very practical in terms of when I'm looking at my iterations, I'm, I'm trying to look at, you know, is there a point at which we could get something launched before we stop again for some kind of sort of holiday? 
um, then coming into to the spring and into the summer in the west, but then into the to the winter for you guys. It's it's just trying to pick those times through June, July, August. And then we're back into getting things done before the end of the year. So certainly chunking things up in a very responsive way based on business flows as well. Um, all the different industries that we represent have different timings. I mean, I know over here, the universities I work with, if I don't get things done by the 15th of August, I've missed the whole academic year. It, it's done. You, you missed it. Um, I know that the car industry sells the most in the spring and then the early autumn. Um, knowing that those peaks are there, it is not the time uh, to put in um, perhaps a, a, a new sales tool um, for those dealerships. That's not the time to do it. So I think we always have to keep an eye on that pragmatism. Uh, and that's, I think, what I really like about Agile is that it it is constantly informed by the business need and that business pragmatism rather than, well, this is my timetable to deliver technical excellence and I'm sticking to it come what may. I think it's that collaboration between the two that's really helpful. So this is our roadmap and we've chunked it up at the end of every iteration. That star there is the outcome. We should have a new capability. And this again is agile thinking. It's not that I've got something that I've gone live with, that I've turned on. That's not what we're talking about. In agile, what we're doing is we are always parceling together the creation of the, the new functionality with the behavioral change piece. So in every iteration, we should have taken people through that behavioral change piece around making them aware and interested getting them feeling positive and bought into what we're doing, giving them plenty of opportunities to participate and then bedding it down. Well, the bedding down is obviously going to be the long tail, but we can at least get it to a point where we've gone live at the end of every iteration, not just with the new thing, but also all of the support package that enables people to actually start using it and changing their ways of working. And to keep us on track, let's keep it simple. Um, let's have three processes. Um, getting started, um, where we do all the brainstorming, we do all of the planning. It's obviously on a mini scale, but we're, the key thing, of course, is we are Moscowing. The must-haves, the should-haves, the could-haves, and of course, those won't-haves. So we are constantly looking at what we should be doing. We'll dive into making progress where we bring together um, that creation of the, the tangible piece with all of the preparation, if you like, for, for the business to be ready. You know, for me, projects are build the aircraft, um, change management is build the runway and the terminal buildings, we can actually use it. And then in realizing benefits, that's when we go live and we make sure everybody's up to speed. And all of this, if you like, is driven by um, those five concepts we looked at, because, of course, this iterative approach gives you the evolving solution. That evolving solution, you know, it, the two come together. We evolve based on business need. Yeah? So the business need is driving our decision on which outcome or which capability comes first and what comes next. And we keep to on time delivery. I've just talked about Moscow, choosing the must-haves, the should-haves, the could-haves, knowing that if things are taking longer than we'd hoped or are more complicated and are therefore soaking up more time, well, I started with my must-haves and it's looking tight for time. I'm going to jettison my could-haves because I'm still going to stick to the deadline. If it goes hideously wrong, I will have to jettison my should-haves as well. But... I should then have a must have. I will have the minimum, minimum viable product is a phrase often used in Agile, minimum usable subset. They all start with the phrase minimum, minimum shippable product. Um, but by the end of each iteration, I will have something workable. Um, if it was a complex piece of work that took longer than we'd hoped, it might not have all the, the extra bits that would make it look great or even easier to use, but it's workable it's gone into use, it's making a difference for the business, and we are starting to see some early return on investment. 
the, the could haves and perhaps even the should haves that I jettisoned from one iteration go back into the list of all the things we're thinking of doing and we'll shuffle that deck of cards again and we will again pick out the must haves, the should haves, the could haves. So that business need, we have the business speaking up on what can they live without, what is an absolute essential to them. And of course, in order to do that, collaboration sits around all of this. So that's a very fast uh, definition of, of agile change. So we've done sort of 20 minutes on the basics. Um, I'm going to get into how I use this now to actually help me um, run the initiatives. And I'm going to talk very practical experience of the things that are going on with me um, and the, the initiatives that I'm working on. Um, and I'm going to look at some of my biggest issues. So if you've got anything that you want to raise or any questions you've got about this, put them in the chat. As soon as Mark sees anything in the chat, he interrupts me where he thinks it will be a good question to ask. Isn't that right, Mark? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Get your okay. questions in, folks. Yeah. Any observations, anything you want to say? So, oops, there we go. I think one of the biggest issues um, is these days getting an initiative off the ground in the right direction um, with business need is that we are in an uncertain world. I, um, as soon as I finish this webinar, um, because it is very early here, I'm going to um, grab another piece of toast and then I'm going into um, a strategy day. Um, I am taking responsibility for a major transformation for an organisation um, throughout 2022. Um, and today we are focusing on what that transformation should actually contain. Now, 2022 doesn't feel that certain at the moment. Um, the pandemic is still raging across Western Europe here. Um, we haven't opened all of our borders around the world. Um, we've got all of the uncertainty about what it really feels like in terms of the future of work. Um, many of us are doing working from home or hybrid working. I went back into the office in April, um, but I'm only back in my office several days a week. Um, and it's certainly a, a very different and far more fluid than it was before. It's making it really difficult for me to predict exactly what our customers want um, and what those business volumes might be. So the first thing is, with all of that uncertainty, um, certainly a more traditional approach where we gather all of our requirements up front and then we plan what those are going to be in a lovely Gantt chart, which oh, I miss those days because it did look certain, didn't it? Uh, a Gantt chart, you, I'm going to do this, then this, then this, then this. And at the end, I'm going to deliver the complete solution. Oh, I miss that because it looked like I knew what I was doing from start to finish. Of course, we know that's not the truth because I would be knocked off course multiple times by things that we weren't able to predict. Agile change, I think, gets us off and running in this very uncertain world because we're saying, let's concentrate on the end goal. What is it that we want to be different? What capabilities do we want? Um, who do we want to be servicing? What customers do we want to be targeting um, this time next year? What sort of products and services do we think they want? How do we want to be delivering that? Do we want to be rebuilding um, uh, an internal capability? Do we want to be offshoring or nearshoring? How is that really going to work in practice? I'm sorry if you can hear the noise behind me. This is a St. Bernard who's just waking up in the morning. So he's sort of trotting around having a bit of a shake. Um, 72 kilos though, so um, I can't push him off. He's just got it. I just have to wait for him to settle down again. <laughs> Yeah, one last shake, thanks. <laughs> um, so that uncertainty means that if I ask about the, the, the bigger, the end goal, so we know what that capability is. So I've got that fulcrum around which I can make all my prioritization decisions because I know what the business really need, but how we're going to deliver it. What exactly are the products and services that they need first? Well, let's chunk that up then. Let's get something up and running. Um, and this is what I've been doing all week. And we, as I said, got a big meeting about it today because by really understanding what the customer wants and, and who we're targeting at the end of the day has really shaped up what we're going to do first. The organization I'm working for, um, they, this is a whole digital transformation. And one of the biggest 
things that we've done with this end goal concept is that really by focusing on what do you want me to deliver for you? What do you want to be different? They've realized that their original understanding of we're going to digitize our product range isn't what they want. What they want, they say, is that we want all of our products to go online, but actually let's keep what we've got at the moment. What we want you to do now is not digitize what we already have. We want you to create a whole new product range. So let's get new products out and start attracting new customers because the purpose of this is to widen our customer base. So they've had that epiphany. And now what I do know is I'm going to create the first new product in the first quarter of next year. Then I may very well have to pivot to something slightly different as their understanding of what happens and what they're aiming for grows in understanding that grows in maturity and again towards the end. But if I wait for that magic moment, and I know that a number of us get caught like this, it's waiting for that magic moment where people say, oh, well, well, let's just do some more research. Let's just do some more focus groups. We need to find out more. Waiting for that perfect moment when apparently we'll have certainty, it's just never going to come. So this agile change approach enables us to get off and running and we create our own certainty, really, because what happens at the end of every iteration where I've put a new capability in place is we can ask, are our assumptions about the future still the same? Has anything happened with our competitors, um, with our customer reactions that make us think that we are absolutely on the right path or that we need to change direction slightly? What do we do next? So we are Moscowing, if you like, at the highest level all of the time. And I find that this really helps us get off and running. If I was trying to do my program for next year in a traditional way, I would be sunk right now um, because I would be gathering a huge number of ideas, requirements, um, requests, um, people tr trying their absolute best to guess what the future might be. But of course, as soon as I've done that and planned everything up front, we've baked many of those assumptions into the plan. And then I'm sort of caught in this trap of, I'm gonna deliver it all, come what may. And of course we know that maybe 60% of it was right, but the other 40% is obsolete before we've even finished developing it. This is a better way around, effectively. This is a very practical chart that I draw. Um, in so many boardrooms around the world. Um, because what I think is really important is that if we get caught in me promising deliverables, I'm going to do this, then this, then this, these are the things you'll have. Um, and I get caught in the how I'm going to be doing things. Um, then I'm really trapped in that more traditional way of doing things. An agile approach look at this what I really know is I know what I'm going to be delivering in the first quarter and in fact I don't know all the details of that yet because you know come the end of next month we will have sort of really planned those first three months definitely but I don't really know the rest of it because I'm going to keep it open because I want to act on feedback so if we just keep to this idea of deliverables I can create a huge amount of uncertainty this is not a plan that would get signed off. But this one is. What I've got is I've concentrated on the end goal. And I then decompose this end goal into, yeah, but what are the big chunks of difference you want me to make? What are the things that you want to be able to do? Um, let's let's really focus on that. And then we can break that down into the things I need to create for you, the requirements. So here, what we're talking about is the capability. So I know that I'm going to put up a whole new product targeting a particular new customer group. And then we're, and that's the customer group that we think is the highest margin in this case. And then the next iteration will be other products, perhaps for that same customer group, or we might say, no, we then want to target another group of customers and widen it that way. That is absolutely the board's decision but I understand what they're aiming for. I understand the difference they want me to make. And then they rely on me and the team to work out how we might actually deliver that difference. 
And that is why I think the agile change approach can get us off and running really quite quickly, because we can overcome this uncertainty and this waiting for the magic moment um, where everything's going to work out OK. We, we have full knowledge. I, I think that ship has sailed. That does not feel like the 21st century sort of business environment to me. One of the other things that I think is really helpful with um, an agile approach is my biggest issue is I want to hear the pragmatic business viewpoint. I want to know from those at the sharp end who are delivering services to customers what exactly is needed, what's working right now, what's not working, what do they not need as much as what they do need. The problem is twofold, I think. Number one, um, there is so much change going on that I'm in a competitive marketplace um, and I'm, I'm competing for the same people's time. Um, there are a number of people known in the business as people who really know their staff, highly experienced, um, can articulate what's required. Um, and every project or change initiative out there wants their time. But the problem is that they've also got, and what makes them so useful is their business as usual responsibilities. That's what keeps them close to what's actually needed. So I think there's something here about how do I respect people's time because I need their intervention? And also, how do I make sure that I protect time? What I've just said about that uncertainty um, around the, the deliverables versus the, the outcomes, it does mean that how I deliver the promise of the new product range by the end of uh, uh, by the end of the first quarter, um, I'm going to work with some amazing technical experts, and we're we're going to dig into it, and we're going to come up with all of the requirements, and we're going to Moscow all of those things. But it's very much a moving feast, so it is really important in an agile approach to stick to the timetable because you've got to give your business some certainty and that's the certainty that we end up working on. I, By giving you a certain time frame, I'm also to a large extent guaranteeing you the cost because the huge amount of cost associated with our initiatives is us, it's the people cost. And the longer we keep us in working on something, the more it costs. So what we need to do is protect that timetable and i think that this sort of agile approach really helps us do that because we start with we understand the capability we understand what it is that we're supposed to be creating and we can pinpoint what are the specialist resources um, and what are the those resources from the business that we genuinely need to work with at the start of the initiative, when we're really bringing well, the iteration and we're, we're really working out all the things that need to be done, that's when we can start to identify exactly how we're going to be using those specialist resources. And in fact, we can put sprints or time boxes in place, probably a couple of weeks, where we can say we really need you on these two weeks. But the rest of the time, it will be OK. We, we don't need you as much so that you start to sort of respect the time of the business that are, in fact, they are becoming the massive limiting resource I'm finding on so many of my initiatives. Because without the voice of the business, how do I make sure that I'm prioritizing against business need? But if they are already caught up in multiple other change initiatives, then that becomes a problem. And I think if I can do this very clear plan, I've been working with an organization who are all using this approach and there are two pieces of feedback from them. Number one um, is that by having this very high level plan focused on the capabilities, they are having brilliant conversations about the interdependencies between their initiatives. Because instead of getting caught up in all the detail where it's really difficult to see all the different interdependencies, they start talking at the start of the, the capability. We're going to shift the business to be able to do this that it doesn't currently do. Oh, we're shifting the business to be able to do this. How do these two line up? Well, ours is coming a couple of months before yours. and This means they would have had to shift all of these things. They're having some great conversations about interdependencies. So that's really validating. Have they got the order right? 
And the second thing is that by having these higher level plans, they can have a real conversation about some of the resources which seem to be being called into nearly every initiative. And by working that that sort of totality of impact out pretty early on, um, they can also think about, as one of my clients has done, they have sort of expanded the number of subject matter experts, the SMEs as they refer to them. Um, we've actually done, I, I still don't like the term, term, but anyway, we've done an SME breeding program um, where what we've done is um, taken people from the business who perhaps um, are not the highest level of experience, um, but they're certainly energetic, they're certainly committed to change, um, they do have a, a working knowledge of what's happening, and we're upskilling them in agile and, and change management uh, training to really get them on board to help us work on these initiatives. And, and it's been one of my ongoing pieces of work is to expand out the number of resources available. But it all comes back to this simple plan, this roadmap approach that as each of the different initiatives are using it, we're all talking the same language. We're all focusing on outcomes, which of course keeps it all very strategic, um, which enables far better conversations um, with the sponsor as well, which I think is, is really helpful. In fact, I was on a, a workshop last week where um, a, somebody had an absolute breakthrough moment, um, realising that if he talked about the outcomes of every iteration with his sponsor, um, and it, the conversation went brilliantly, um, by doing that, um, he was able to keep the conversation about what the business needs and he was able to draw out from his sponsor, his senior responsible owner, much more about what's happening in the business, what's happening strategically, what are the big initiatives that that sponsor is aware of um, that might have an impact. And he said, the big thing for me, Melanie, is that previously I would have been uh, putting in front of him my Gantt chart. And I would have been talking him through all the things we're going to do. So all of our actual work and how it all flows one into the other and the interdependencies. And of course, he said that kept the conversation at a at almost like at a micromanagement level, because although my sponsor doesn't really have an understanding of what all those activities involve, because they're the sponsor, they want to sort of have some oversight and they want to make some contribution. So I'd be asked these sort of nitpicky little questions that, frankly, my sponsor didn't always understand the answer, but felt that they had to ask anyway. What a waste of time on both sides. He said the conversations I'm now having at that more strategic level based on outcomes and capabilities is fantastic. Now, I raise that story because actually I think that is something I hear all the time. It's certainly my experience, but it's interesting to hear that so many others are having the same experience and rolling out this roadmap to the sponsor so they can see where the capabilities are. But rolling out this roadmap to line managers who are supposed to give up their staff to help on these initiatives where you can show exactly what contribution they're going to be making and when. That's a, a far more productive conversation uh, and actually you get far more commitment on that basis as well. One of the other most common things is that um, I am working on uh, change initiatives where behind the scenes, the tangible changes are being created in this more waterfall, more traditional way. Um, where they have got a plan, they gathered all the requirements up front, they pull together that plan and they will deliver a complete solution at a specific date. And it may very well be that this is all controlled by a procurement process that's gone down this route. Um, and therefore, what that project team are really focusing on is they've got to get through everything and get to the end. And for those of us who've managed these waterfall or traditional projects, we know what pressure they're under. Of course, the thing is that I've got one of these um, where it's delivering a whole new HR platform, apparently on the 30th of June next year, although I've already, I think we're aware that they're going to deliver late, just not sure when exactly. Uh, because I'm hoping it will be a post-COVID summer, um, I'd quite like July and August where I can have um, some relaxing time with the family out going to the beach and things. Um, so I'm hoping they'll deliver maybe into September now. Um, but that's what I'm dealing with. And of course, 
I'm here. I've got, it might be a whole new HR platform, but as a result of it, there's a whole restructure of the HR function. We are going to be trying to push more out to uh, line managers and staff to do for themselves. We want HR to take a more strategic role in the business. So I've got an awful lot of, of work to do in changing the, the, the values, the behaviours. So it's very cultural, um, but also very basic stuff like uh, streamlining some of the existing processes, getting rid of a lot of the manual steps we have now. Even though the system's not yet available, we know what its capability will be and we can start to change our way of working to align with it, even though it's not here yet. And I think that's the thing with an agile approach, I can still make differences. I can still implement new capability. Um, I'm doing all the restructuring of HR. I'm doing all of the training and upskilling of HR, knowing that their system is coming later. Um, I was working with a, a company across Europe recently where um, they are changing their warehousing and distribution. Um, one of the things that's, that's happening is that certain roles are disappearing. Uh, for example, um, the way in which the, the new distribution centre will be built, all based on uh, robotic equipment, it's the forklift truck drivers that actually we won't be using that kind of approach anymore. Um, we're going to be asking them to take on new roles. We're not trying to get rid of anybody um, and that fight for labour that a lot of us are in at the moment. Um, but they will have completely new roles, which is much more about evaluating data um, and trying to work out where perhaps the distribution process that shoots parcels uh, in, in sort of split seconds um, uh, across the warehouse will actually maybe be falling down and they have to step in quite quickly and um, uh, maybe slow the, the process down or, or stop it while something gets fixed. A completely different skill set. Um, I know that, the, that there's not a lot I can do. The warehouse itself is at the moment, it's um, a greenfield site and it's being built um, and all the robotic equipment is being, and then the entire sort of um, mechanised production line is being dealt with right now. But it's definitely a waterfall project. It's, it's not something you can do in a more agile way. But all the preparation for every, every team that's affected, yeah, we've definitely started that. So I think there is there are lots of ways that we can align with a, a waterfall or traditional project. But I will use empathy for a moment and say that one of the things I know is that if you have got that end to end plan and you have got a drop dead date, the last thing you want is to hear any more requirements. You're trying to bat away change, if you like. And so I need them to, to really trust me enough to share what they're doing, give me that early insight into what they're creating and what the functionality will be. But I also have to sort of honour that contract between us in that that informal relationship. I can't keep going back. Going, oh, you couldn't just change this. Oh, you couldn't just change that. I might want to. Believe me, I might want to. But I know that they have a contract and they will be delivering that platform. And I know that some of that stuff next summer might not be as useful as it could be. But actually, I'm going to try and build a trusted relationship where I don't keep annoying them. But I am also offering them, if they give me the early insight, there is a payback here that by the time they get towards the last couple of months where they're really going into user acceptance testing, they will have a group of people who are willing to take part in that and are actually schooled and ready to make a sizable contribution. So I do think an agile approach um, can work very well with a waterfall approach. And, and I think we have to make it work. It's not our, it, it, that waterfall decision was taken long before I came on board. So my job is to make it work in a very practical sense. And then I think finally we are coming into a world where there are frankly too many changes at once. I've talked about the impact on the business of all the things that are happening. And, and, and this is how it feels in, a, in the business as usual environment. It feels like this, you know, that I've got my agile change where I'm going to be bringing on uh, change sort of wave after wave. Now, we can argue, can't we, that in a, a more agile approach, perhaps the my changes are more specific. Um, they are there's a better boundary around them. They're more easily understood because they are almost smaller in scale rather than whoosh. There's the complete solution. Change everything. 
what we do is we peel off small and specific and focused changes and then but we do then we do that again and again and again so i'm aware that moving to this more agile change approach um as opposed to a more traditional approach where i've got one complete solution i've quadrupled quintupleted the amount of change that i'm putting in each time because i'm i'm putting in a cycle of change after every iteration and of course as i've just said i'm not the only change going on um and you know, i might be doing a restructure of hr but there's quite a lot of other changes taking place in the organization as well um, where uh, perhaps they are restructuring around certain products and services um, they've got changes that there's a massive finance transformation going on at the same time which there's a knock-on effect around payroll and of course hr have a big impact on that so i'm not the only ones competing for their time and this is how it feels you know change one changes the shape of business as usual then just change two changes the shape then change three and then change four change five change six business as usual there's there's no sort of stability it feels like they're on shifting sands all of the time and i think as a result of that one of the things that perhaps in an agile change approach that really in the bigger picture i focus on is that we need to consider how we're making change happen and i think we need to partner very carefully project delivery and change capability. And in fact, what I want to do is perhaps in, in terms of change management, being much more explicit about what's involved. What does, what does change management actually really mean? What are all the activities needed to make this happen? Um, let's make sure that people understand that um, that change management is not a mystery um, that people understand this transition curve and sort of can take themselves through it um, and are really excited um, to be uh, to be a part of it that there's a self-direction element that makes people feel in control of their own lives that autonomy piece we know that's connected to um, intrinsic motivation um, we want to create that environment of psychological safety um, and for me, I was writing on LinkedIn the other day, somebody's been posing questions about what psychological safety is. And I think in, a, in the widest cultural piece, it's about feeling um, free in a no blame environment to speak up. But I think in a, in a change specific environment, it is about giving people all of the support package, all of the tools that help them, the practice activities, um, the opportunities to read up on something and, and gather their thoughts before they, they're exposed to it. If they like to prepare ahead, um, if they're more of an activist, they want to dive in and have a go, let them have a sandbox to practice in. It's all of those things um, that we should be preparing. And we, probably one of the biggest issues, I think, is that if we've got these massive number of changes that we also need to provide that emotional resilience um, uh, manage the stress and anxiety of change because the volume of change isn't going anywhere um, it's only going to increase so i think there's there's a lot in here that um, i think we can do to help ourselves and it's over to questions um, i'll uh, turn over to, to mark is there anything you would like to pose for me yeah, yeah, I can see a few questions here. But, um, this one came in before the last couple of slides, so you did address it somewhat, but um, just in case you want to touch on it again, what's, what's your approach or approaches to change resistance and how does Agile change help? Um, I think, um, first of all, I think Agile change can help in one way in that um, I'm not threatening, I'm not the source of everything's going to change. And I think with an agile change approach, um, first of all, we'll just go back to the roadmap one so that we've got that in front of us. I think here is a good example, the roadmap. I think that what we can say is we can be quite specific. Um, it's if, if change is it sounds like there's a threat to everything that I know um, and all of my certainty, then that is incredibly threatening. And uh, yeah, my resistance levels will absolutely go up. Whereas if I can peel off smaller changes one by one, um, that's much easier to explain to people. And of course, I have the advantage of psychologically being able to say, well, yes, um, we are removing that template and we are changing the screen so that we've got these drop down menus. Um, 
I can be more specific about what it is that's changing. But I also got the opportunity to say, but all these other things remain the same. And we know how powerful that is in removing stress and therefore removing the resistance of change. So I think that this, if you like, that this slow sort of move through each of the iterations, and in fact, even each of the sprints within those iterations can be incredibly helpful in not overloading somebody with a huge amount of change. That would be my answer to that one. Great, thanks, Pat. Um, and how do you deal with project or change sponsor sponsors that don't or won't engage sufficiently? Well, I think this goes back to um, talking in their language. Now, I'm talking now as a former CEO, so I am talking about let's get this, um, let's get here, let's talk about the end goal, and let's talk about what difference do you want to meet, make in the business. I think that. First of all, I can appeal to vanity if I'm doing this because I can basically ar arrange a meeting with a sponsor where I can sort of say, um, first of all, um, I really need your help to understand the business. So appealing to their vanity because they're the ones that have those answers. But I think why I'm engaging so well with my sponsors is because I am saying, look, the end goal is really your strategic objectives. Whatever you're measured against, let's make sure that this initiative is delivering that. And so getting into that conversation about what is it, what difference are they supposed to be making? Now, we can immediately see that if you are at a senior level within an organisation, you've got three immediate responsibilities. It doesn't matter where you work. One of those is to reduce costs wherever possible. Another one is to increase either revenue if you're in the commercial sector or productivity if you're in the not-for-profit or governmental sectors. And finally, you have a third responsibility, which is only really come into the boardroom in the last five years or so, um, but it is very much around the, either the, you could call it social impact, you could call it the reputation of your organization, um, the meaningfulness of your organization, um, but whether or not you're doing the right things in the right way. So pretty much without knowing who my sponsor is, um, I can start to, to think about how, what is the end goal that they need for their particular area of the business with those three factors in it. See what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to walk in their shoes and empathize and keep my conversations with them at that level. I'm keeping them away from all of the detail because frankly, they don't need to be a part of that. What they want is to see what difference I'm going to make. And I think that's the language that I want to talk in. What difference am I going to make? What improvements am I going to offer? How early? And there's a frequency to the stream of benefits I'm going to be adding. So I keep my conversations at the objectives, the strategic objectives level. Um, I keep my conversations at the capability level. And I talk about what the business benefits will be. Um, and that really engagement is about um, talking to people about the things that they are interested in um, and those are the things they're interested in. What I don't do to them is I don't give them all of the reporting on busyness, I report on achievement um, and what it is that I've actually done that's different. Um, I give them the answer to the question, why have we been paying for you for the last three months? And you go, well, this is what you have now that you didn't have before. So I think there's something in there about use your empathy, work out what their interests are and, and make sure the conversation's at that level. Thanks, Will. Um, this one probably builds into the um, change resistance piece a bit as well. How do you build emotional resilience? Um, funnily enough, in the second edition of the Agile Change Management textbook that I re I had to do the second edition um, all the way through lockdown. Um, so other people did things like redecorate their house and learn to bake bread. Um, and I had to write a second edition of a book. Um, but as you may know, second editions require you to write another 20 to 25 percent of text um, and to take out other things and streamline. So I dedicated the extra quarter of the book that I then had to write the new bit to effectively um, behavioural change and emotional resilience was key to that. And what I've done in the book is come up with lots and lots of practical activities 
from the worlds of neuroscience and positive psychology. They're all practical reframing techniques to see things in a different way. There's a lot of gratitude techniques in there. Um, they're all about reducing stress um, because we know that if we reduce stress, then we are more creative. Um, if we're more creative, we're also, when we reduce stress, more generous in our dealings with others. Um, so we can bring more information together, we can connect the dots, we can have new insights. So we're innovative and creative, and also we're more generous with others, um, and therefore we're more likely to listen to the views of others. Resilience for me is that determination to keep going when you doubt yourself, when all the factors around you point to um, an imminent failure, but you still have that persistence to just keep going. Um, and I train on a huge number of those um, activities in the, uh, the Agile Change uh, training. Great stuff. Thanks, Phil. Um, one final question here. Um, how do you address organisations that say they want to be Agile without changing any of their processes? processes or structure um, and in brackets doing agile versus being agile um yeah that's a, that's an absolute key thing and i think there is something here around um it is at the, at the leadership level um i use some of these diagrams to to show that um if we try to gather all the requirements up front um uh, and then just parcel them out um then we we won't actually have created something what i, I go back to the first principles i want to create a new capability for you very early on Sometimes, in a very practical sense, I have to sort of almost look at each iteration of the roadmap, let me go back, um, uh, almost as like a mini project, because they're still running it in a more traditional way. Um, so that's effectively what I'm having to do, is I'm, I'm using some of their existing processes, but I'm actually using, using it within this roadmap concept. And I find that that's probably the, the first attempt I have, because there's no point talking to people if they've got a sort of closed mind and the question indicates that maybe that organization has a closed mind of yeah we don't we we say we want something but we don't want to change so i think well okay i'm going to have to work under the covers here and so what i'll do is i'll use their existing approach but i will do it in this agile roadmap way so i will do a very small scale project effectively um in my iteration and then i'll deliver that piece and then i'll move on to the next one so I think there's ways that if you keep going back to this simplistic roadmap technique, you can you can see easily may, maybe where you can um, keep going in how they want to do it, but you are effectively working in an agile way. And it's only, um, I think organizations a lot of the time learn by doing. Um, and what you will have done is put a new capability into place very early on and show that actually um, you can then the, the next project if you like the next iteration will build on that um, and the feedback from it but already you're showing that you're getting early return on investment you're making a difference early on and i, I must admit I, I i would tend to do that in many of the organizations where i face exactly the same challenge thanks very much well that's uh takes us very close to the hour so we'll, we'll... Uh, begin to wrap up there. I think we've got one or two further info slides towards the end, haven't we? We have. Um, Mark's just reminding me that, you know, as usual, I haven't done the full bit. So I did the question one, though. See, I've got to the question mark, but there we go. Um, there's an awful lot more resources. I know on this webinar we've had two handouts around the certification, um, but if you want more information, um, I write quite a lot on this subject. So um, find me on LinkedIn um, and you'll find that I do keep the, the conversation going. I'm always producing resources. Um, I send out a newsletter every month with my retrospectives if you like across all the initiatives i sort of sit back and go how is this going really what have i learned this month and i try to to provide some new material each time um, that hopefully is gives you practical solutions to how you might do this yeah and look at look out in the follow-up email folks because uh we'll as well as, as well as the bits of info you see on screen here we'll link to millennial on linkedin as well to so make it easier for you to uh to find and connect um, so I think that just leaves us. Uh, should we give a, a, a brief one-liner, Mel, about the about the two courses? I mean, you know, the Agile Change Agent in particular, having developed it, and you're a long, uh, long-time trainer for the Change Management Scheme as well. 
Um, the change management scheme, I think, is really important because it builds fundamental knowledge. If you need to know the theories and models of change management, um, particularly if you're working with a lot of consultants who, who perhaps know that, get that certification because it really does benchmark that you know your stuff. If you are experienced in change already and you think, yeah, but I've been working in this agile way. Actually, I might not have called it a roadmap, but I've been doing this quite a lot. Get yourself that agile change qualification because, frankly, it cuts through an awful lot on your CV because it's got the word agile and it's got the word change in there. So those are the two hottest topics. And it does actually give you a chance to come up with lots of practical act activities and new techniques. Both qualifications, well, anybody who knows me will know I'm a big fan of certifications because I think they are a shortcut to seeing, well, that person invests in their career, that person keeps themselves up to date, that person puts extra effort in. I mean, just by having um, a digital badge on your social media, it just shows me something about you um, and the kind of person you are. So either one of those qualifications is a, a winner for me. <laughs> great stuff thanks well um so that's that's it folks we'll uh we'll wrap things up there uh so it just leaves me to thank everyone very much for joining us and thank you mel for your insights and expertise as ever uh very much appreciated and uh we know most of the folks joining us uh here are in australia and new zealand so we're we're dipping into your evening so thanks again for joining us um and as i said before look out for the follow-up email as soon as we've got the uh recording online we'll we'll get that follow-up email out with some additional links so thanks again everyone uh enjoy the rest of your evening bye-bye thanks bye